early session this morning. Uh, I think we're just about it closing now, so maybe we'll, we'll take it away. So for uh, the, uh, I guess our data analytics um, uh, plenary speaker today, we have Stan Batwin from the Computer Science Department here at uh, Dalhousie. So Stan's going to be uh, giving us a talk on uh, big water beats big data. I like that title. So uh, thank you very much, Stan. Thank you. I don't know if the microphone works uh, in the back of the class. Well, it's great to be here. I'm very grateful to the organizers for having me. Uh, it's uh, fantastic to talk to a, a group of mathematicians because I come from mathematics. My uh, undergraduate and masters were both in math from, a, I think, a good math school back in uh, Poland, in Warsaw, Poland. Uh, and uh, then I have moved to other things, uh, uh, into computer science. Uh, at Dalhousie since 2013, and when I have arrived here uh, on the East Coast, I got for the first time exposed to this very cool data set, which I think is really uh, something that we as a, a species, as humanity, uh, will, are and will be making great use of. And it's something that uh, is relatively unknown uh, to the general public. I have only learned about it. Uh, uh, when I moved here, and uh, it definitely uh, gives you uh, an opportunity uh, to do very advanced uh, big data research, and uh, it's a big data research that's a uh, analytically sophisticated uh, and significant, and b I think also in most of its applications, it's this kind of data science, uh, uh, data mining that is now labeled. Uh, data mining for the social good. So uh, while this definitely has commercial applications, it's not the kind of big data that's supposed to you know, sell you more diapers or uh, make you connect to this particular website. It's something else, and I'll argue that it's something very interesting. So I'll uh, use my 50 or 55 minutes, uh, then we'll do questions. But of course, as I move on, and there's anything that requires a, a clarification, uh, please let me know immediately. Uh, so, let me just introduce this data set first on the left. So, this is something that exists now for uh, more than 10 years. Uh, it's a, a technology that has been introduced into the world's shipping around 2004 by the International Maritime Organization. And very importantly, it was supported and uh, standardized. That's the key thing, that's the standard technology by the International Relocation Union. And what it is is that every ship, about 300 tons, so sort of mid to large size ship, on the oceans, must carry a transponder that constantly emits a signal. Uh, it's a signal, a record that consists of 27 fields that give a lot of information about the ship and its dynamics. In particular, it gives you the GPS coordinates of the vessel, gives you the speed and the course over ground. And also, uh, in, in that field, there is a room, and usually uh, the data is there, that uh, contains kind of a license plate of the ship according to IMO records. It's got something that in the trade is called MIMSI. Uh, and you think about it as a license plate for the ship in a sense that it's not a unique identifier of the vessel when the ship is sold or transfers ownership, that number changes. And that number can be used to identify the ship in different types of data sets. Some of them are public, some of them are proprietary. But by and large, if you have that number, you can find a lot of information about the ship, its size, its tonnage, its owner, uh, its history, and so on and so forth. So, so this is a sort of a gateway to a lot of additional information. That information is sent by the ship every 6 to 60 seconds, usually. And it goes out uh, to other ships in the area. It go, they, they go, the signal, of course, goes out uh, to uh, the shore stations that may capture it. And today, anybody can walk to a Best Buy and for about $50 buy a software radio. Uh, uh, download from the internet the software to make that 
the software radio and AIS receiver, put it on the roof of a larger building here in Halifax, and receive AIS signals from the local area. But of course, only to the horizon. Beyond, beyond the horizon, you need a satellite. But if you have a receiver on a satellite, you can collect that signal from around the globe. And of course, you will need more than one satellite. Here's a little bit of an illustration of that. Uh, so uh, there are satellites that uh, belong to different organizations. We run this. Uh, and that move and cover uh, in a circular shape areas of the Earth. So if you are in a given uh, area, let's say somewhere here, uh, you'll at some point a satellite whoop now will come and you will be on radar, so to speak. Your signal will be received. But on the other hand, you see that there are gaps that uh, mean that for a certain period of time there is no signal. Now, interestingly enough, uh, the history of this system is quite uh, educational because the system was put together for safety purposes. The idea is was that if ships, like in this uh, figure here, uh, sail, and they are around some natural obstacle, they can know in advance that they may come on a collision course with other ships. But then people have noticed that it can also be collected by satellites. And if you collect that signal through a satellite, you gather incredibly rich information uh, that uh, is definitely big data. And I have an illustration here, which is something that I, you know, occasionally I give these talks, and this is my key message at the beginning. So what is this picture on the right? This is what we call a heat map of AIS. So this is uh, AIS signal over a period of 12 months, actually 2016, put on a grid. Each uh, grid uh, square is 0.1 of a geographic degree. And uh, it's simply rendered on a black surface, and the intensity of the signal shows you the frequency of ships being observed in that area over a 12 month period. All right? So it's really, there is no processing. You just take the raw data as is, project it in a very, very simple manner, and all of a sudden you get something incredibly deep in a sense that it took humanity millennia to figure out geography of the globe, and we can put it together on our server in a space of minutes with that signal. And to me, this is an excellent illustration of the power of what we call big data in a sense that there's a lot of simple individual signal. One signal on its own is not really very valuable, but when you take it together in a large volume and use it in a certain way that can be very simple, you all of a sudden discover very significant key results, like this thing here. So this is uh, sort of what big data to me is all about. And of course, there are definitions and uh, the different discussions about different uh, characteristics of big data that one could go into and, uh, and uh, ponder. And this is not really my idea to do that today. I thought it would be more interesting to tell you about some of the work we do with this data, which we find very exciting and kind of really edge. Now, I have to say that we are able to do that work because we have uh, partnership, collaborative relationship with a Canadian company called Exact Earth that actually is one of the two or three major global collectors and suppliers of this data. They have a network of satellites that they have built up very significantly in 2016 and in 2017 and they are now close to full coverage of the globe in real time. So this issue of gaps that I was talking about kind of disappears. There are other problems with this data that I will talk about in a moment, but uh, we have access to this data and uh, that's why we can work with it. So this is big data that we have. I mentioned data gaps. Uh, there is, of course, noise in the data. And that noise in the data is mainly due, unfortunately, to human manipulation of the data. Ships either turn off the AIS receiver emitter completely, for instance, fishing ships 
do not want to be observed, and they do this. And this is now illegal in territorial waters of the major countries around the globe. So I think it would disappear at least within the 200 mile uh, space from the shores. But of course, in oceans, it may still remain. It's interesting that there are ideas on how to resolve this. But also, very often, ships uh, play with this mimsy that ship identifies. So they do keep their receiver open, but their mimsy is incorrect. And that sometimes is the result of, of the genuine human error, and sometimes it's a manipulation, because you may have, again, a fishing ship that declares that he's certain ferry that you know, normally services the west coast of Africa. But in a sense, this is a very precious uh, set of data that allows people to do uh, very uh, neat things with it. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I will be talking about some of these uh, things here. Uh, let me just uh, turn off my timer. And so, uh, so, so we, a little bit about the, the volume of that. 400,000 vessels around the globe are equipped with the emitters. Not necessarily all are in motion and sending the signal, but by and large, there is at least 100 million records a day that this system produces, and these 100 million records get stored and needs to be organized and, and processed. And I will talk a little bit about the challenges of doing this. So, I, my, my talk, I will talk a little bit about ocean data, and I will talk a little bit about um, the AIS signal. I, did already, and its applications in fisheries in particular. There are others, but I will uh, focus on fisheries because, like I said, it's this kind of data science for the social good, which I think uh, uh, is a, this research is a good example of, uh, of that. Uh, uh, we have worked uh, on this project with a group of fish ecologists here at Dalhousie, so this isn't just sort of our ideas of how to uh, make the world happier, but uh, it's actually driven by the need from the field, so to speak. Uh, I will uh, talk for a minute, if I have time, about some of the cool machine learning work we do, because we are originally a machine learning group. That's my background and my research in the terms of, in the sense of uh, so the normal classification. I'm a machine learner, and uh, uh, my graduate students uh, all work on machine learning uh, algorithms and uh, applications, and therefore what we bring to the game is uh, machine learning, and machine learning particularly with the use of AIS data, and our vision for this group here at Alhousi is to become the world's leading center for doing machine learning with AIS data. And I think uh, it's an interesting objective because, like I said, the AIS data is becoming more and more present, more and more pervasive in a number of applications, and there will be a uh, great need for uh, techniques that can analyze this data, while at the same time the data brings in its own set of specific idiosyncratic uh, issues that uh, are not obvious in the end. So I will talk a little bit about the early work we do with uh, the deep learning techniques and uh, uh, I will talk a bit about the, the nitty-gritty big data challenges at the system level, which are not uh, necessarily analytical and mathematical, but they are the making or making of the work we need. Because uh, the number one thing, the volume of data is such that the existing, say, database technologies completely fail. You cannot put this data in a database and work with it. The volume is too big. So we have to do something else. What do we do? I tell you. So a few characteristics of this data. In 2016, we have received, uh, and we get this on a monthly basis from Exact there. Uh, we have received uh, 1.3 terabytes. In 26, 2017, sorry, 2017, our estimate is about 3 to 5 terabytes coming in. And in 2018, <laughs> we will be getting something like 15 terabytes. So you see the exponential scaling of the data very clearly, and this is in connection with uh, Hayab's law, which I think is something that uh, is not really very well known, but it's cool to 
realize because it has very deep implications on our thinking about the data in general. So we all know Moore's law, right, that the speed of processors doubles every 18 months. And there is this person, Sam Hayat, who's one of the uh, original big uh, contributors to uh, data mining, and he's observed empirical data and said that, like, for processor speed, the period of doubling is 18 months. For memory, the period of doubling of memory for the same size is nine months. And of course, what underlies this is that these volumes double because there is need for them. We produce more and more data. So essentially, we saturate that memory every nine months, but we can process it only every 18 months. So if you put it together, our ability to process the data that we produce exponentially decreases. So this is a very interesting empirical finding that actually uh, is a hypothesis, but believe me that like Moore's law, if you put the points together, it's there. So this has deep consequences, and I think it indicates at a, a, a very important need of strong analytical techniques that will be able to originally grasp the incoming data and compress it in such a manner that you will be able to still do what we call in the parlance advanced analytics on the compressed data rather than the original data that we have because the original data is just going too fast. So that's kind of a corollary that this uh, AIS data seems to fully satisfy the, the Fayad's memory law. Uh, the data is big data in terms of these V characteristics, right? The, so, uh, one of the, I think it's IBM actually that has come up with these V characteristics. They says that the data set is big data, it has, it has, it has those, so it has a large volume, and I, I don't understand, I mean, my understanding of the large is not necessarily numerical. Large is something else, but I won't go into this. Uh, it has the velocity in a, in a way, in the sense that this data is produced all the time, it's a speed. And uh, since I started, uh, probably about a million records has been produced this morning. Uh, it, uh, it has this heterogeneity that's referred to as a variety V. Uh, to process this data, you need other data uh, to integrate with it. To uh, produce the results you need. So uh, this is there, and I will uh, show you examples. There is the veracity issue, which has to do with the quality of the data, the fact that the data is manipulated, has noise, there's all kinds of problems. And the final V, of course, has the value in the sense that, yes, uh, you can take this, process it, and produce some interesting results. So uh, I think that it's interesting for us as a field especially if we meet here in Halifax to look at this uh, whole data science from the ocean's perspective. And when I have done that, uh, the conclusion seems to me very interesting because oceans are extremely important, more important than uh, we often think. Uh, of course, uh, uh, water is about 70% of the Earth. So I don't remember which uh, writer said that uh, the, the planet should be perhaps more referred to as water than Earth, which certainly is a quantitatively true. Uh, um, oceans are source, the number one source of protein for 4.5 billion people on Earth, so it's more than a half a day. Uh, and they uh, uh, supply likely to 10% of the global population, but they have come late to the saturation of computers and information technology. It's happening now, and now is the time to go into it with the kind of things that we do. And the reason for this is that the engineering community has now gotten its mind around developing very effective sensors that can go in the water and that have uh, also the battery life, such that if you put a sensor on an animal, and that animal goes uh, underwater surface for weeks, the data will be collected, and there will be enough power when it surfaces for this data to be actually broadcast to a satellite, all the data collected for a space of weeks. So these sensors are now a reality, and they can collect 
much more sophisticated data in a sense of not only the identification of the animal, which is classical, you know, you put a sensor that constantly beeps an acoustic signal, and if you read this signal, it tells you why it is this and that. No, no, but you can do much more than that. You can collect uh, the dynamic movement of the animal, you can collect water temperature in time intervals, and there are even sensors uh, elaborated that will give you some information about the physiology of the animal, in particular when it's foraging or not. So with this type of data, fish ecologists can for the first time build global objective models of fish, which I do not have to convince you is extremely important for the humanity because it will inform global level policies regarding fishing. And this is something that uh, we try to help with here. Uh, in a sense, uh, uh, that yes, we work with these people here at all, who uh, one of their objective in fish ecology is to map the fishing exploitation uh, around the world. And what does the mapping mean? Well, here's an example of a particular question they have. It turns out that there exist on the globe areas that have been since 20 years, some of them, labeled as restricted areas, marine protected areas. These are United Nations decided and defined areas where there are limits of human activity. The levels of these limits differ. It's from no entry to no fishing to maybe fishing certain species. These areas, many of them, there is currently more than 6,000 and some are still being added. Many of them exist for 20 years. The research question from these fish ecologists is extremely simple. And it's this. Does the existence of these areas, some of these long-lasting ones, really have or not an effect on marine life in the water column under these areas? And it's an extremely difficult question to answer because you cannot really sample very well this water column, you cannot, uh, you know, survey it, what you do. So one uh, 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 conjecture that they have put together, which is very reasonable, is the following. If indeed there is more marine life because of these restrictions, there will be more fish. If there is more fish, there will be more ships coming in the vicinity of these areas to fish. They cannot enter, but if you look at a certain radius outside, are there more fishing ships there that are actually fishing than in some random area of the ocean? And of course, it's not a proof, but it's a conjecture and a strong evidence in favor of the truthfulness of the hypothesis. So how do you answer that question? Well, of course, that's where the area's signal comes. Because you say, hey, show me the data. How many shipping fishing ships there at a given time? And are they fishing or not? Because having a ship not evidence that he's, he's fishing, right? So this is like, never mind the numbers, this is what we started out with with these colleagues in, uh, in fish ecology here, the lab of uh, my colleague Professor Boris Horn and uh, Christina Berger is a PhD student, and in the back uh, you have uh, organizations such as uh, World Wildlife, Wildlife Fund and so on, the global ecological uh, players that are, of course, vividly interested in this question, not to mention the FAOs and, and other sort of uh, uh, organizations that need to look at this professionally. So they came to us and said, okay, now how do we, uh, how do we answer this question? We have a ship, well, we would know from AIS data if that ship is a fishing ship, because part of it is a label that says, I'm this kind of ship. Uh, of ship. But then, it turns out that there is different types of fishing ships. The three main types, and the types of fishing ships are really decided by what they call the gear, which is the net that the ship is dragging. And uh, it's interesting that because the operations of the net are decided by its shape uh, and its kind of structure, uh, uh, then looking at the movement of the ship, the geometry of the trajectory of the ship, 
or a certain type gives you a very good idea of the type of the ship. There are three main types, trawlers, long liners, and something called first sailors. And don't ask me about first sailors, I never understood that, still working, but I at least understand long liners that essentially move straight and the uh, trawlers that move kind of in an elliptic, uh, in elliptic curves. But anyways, before we go there uh, to my slide, they came to us and we said, well, of course, you know, it's a machine learning problem, what else, right? And uh, it's a machine learning problem because if these fish ecologists take a bunch of data, somebody who understands this relationship between the geometry of the trajectory, whether a certain type of uh, ship is fishing or not, labels this data, they take a segment or a point, and they say, fishing here, here it's not fishing, here it's fishing here. They do it at scale. Then we have the data that machine learning needs. We have instances labeled positive and negative, and then we give it to an induction engine, and this engine learns the profile of a segment of a trajectory for a certain ship, type of ship that says fishing or not fishing. So of course it was a, a machine learning problem for us, and we approached it as such, and that's why you know, we pushed the research in that direction. So of course people have worked on trajectories, but mainly trajectories of human movement, a little bit of animal movement, but you know, on, uh, on the surface of the earth. So these are very different approaches based on different behavior and different issues, and they really do not uh, readily translate to the kind of data that we have here. So we did look at that work, it's quite a bit, but it's mostly about vehicular movement or movement of people having cell phones, that type of thing. Really, it's very different from the data that we use. So here's the data and how it looks. Uh, right here at the top, we have how uh, uh, a trawler moves, essentially, this is perhaps this type of a net, moves elliptically, and the interesting thing is it's quite easy to tell when he's fishing and when he's not fishing by speed. Because if you look at the distribution of speeds, here are the two distributions for when he's fishing and when he's not fishing, and you see that they're quite different, right? So basically, you can tell when he's fishing by learning some threshold on the speed and really using that. that. That seems to be quite easy. That's what we've done. However, long liners are all very different. Long liners, instead of carrying a net like this, they basically drag a very long line. And when I say very long, you know, that's up to 100 kilometers long. So, really long. And then from that line, hang little lines with uh, uh, hooks. And this is how they fish, right? And every so often they roll that in, they turn around, and they go on another straight line. And they move in a zigzag like this. So the geometry of the move is very different, and the segments are decided by significant changes of direction, or what we call in navigation, significant changes of bearing. We'll get into this in a moment. All right. So, of course, the, uh, the speed uh, solution doesn't work anymore. You have the two distributions of when fishing, when fishing and not, and you see that they really uh, very coincidental. So, we have to have a better solution of telling when he's fishing or not, and that's when you have know, the sort of more advanced machine learning comes into play. And that's what we've done. So, this is the data and the problem we work with. Uh, we had uh, 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 good luck of working with this group of biologists, so the key asset and component of this research is that there uh, was a, there is a graduate student, Christina Werder, who sat one summer and through two or three months, labeled thousands of these trajectories with fishing, not fishing, fishing, not fishing. So very patiently, very precisely, painstakingly, she has produced this valuable data. So we now have this more than 200,000 points that were labeled by her in terms of uh, fishing, not fishing, and uh, well, some other data, I won't go into the details, it's not that important. You can find it all 
in his paper plus one uh, with all the, uh, the details of the data and preliminary results. Uh, essentially, the approach in this paper was very simple and uh, was based on a, an observation that uh, we've seen in another paper, this paper here from uh, Fish Ecology. Uh, and these people have uh, said the following reasonable thing. They said, well, if we look at trajectories of ship, ships when they fish or not fish, why would they not be similar to trajectories of large ocean predators when they swim and eat or not? Ah, so with this sort of hypothesis, we, uh, we took from that paper a segmentation method for the data. Because the data we had was point-wise. So it wasn't geometrically given to us as I draw it nicely, but was point by point by point. So in order for us to have contiguous uh, sequences of points when they're fishing, when they're not fishing, and these of course for obvious reasons are not single points, they have to set up for fishing, fish for some time, stop and so on. So these are lines where we have to segment the data. And this segment is highly non-trivial and it's a key uh, thing to do for using machine learning the way we go. So in here we use this LPL segmentation and uh, we have gotten results that are in this plus one paper from last year, which are basically honestly two year old now, because you know take the cycle and all this. But uh, so we've done quite a bit of work since. And that's uh, what I will be talking for the rest of the the top here. Uh, so first of all, we have decided that the key, and this is a very typical machine learning uh, sort of process, is that the key is to uh, produce better features from the data. And somebody said about machine learning that you can't really learn anything without almost already knowing it. And it's true, but it really means that if in this classical approach, uh, the key success in using classification and clustering is in building a correct representation of the data for a given problem. If that is true, then you need a lot of domain knowledge to understand what are the important features of the problem, to involve these features in your uh, data mining, classification, clustering plans. Okay? And uh, this is how machine learning has been always. Now the deep learning people come now and they say, no, it's really not needed. Uh, we can use deep learning methods and they will learn their presentation. And that's very cool. But you know, I think it's not universally true. It's true in certain classes of applications, for instance, with video data, to some extent audio data, and you have to be Google to have the data scale at which this is true. So I think that that sort of play from deep learning is true, but it's not necessarily as universally true as it sometimes is. And we have, and I say this not because I have a hunch, but we've done now a year and a half work of deep learning, using deep learning in this task, and we understand better what the challenges are. Anyways, before we got into deep learning, we looked at it from uh, this point of view, which is, uh, get better features. And remember I said for non-liners, the segment will probably be delimited by the sharp terms of the shape. So we say, okay, let's, and never mind the details here, let's use the belly to uh, catch these sharp terms. And uh, uh, the belly, of course, is something that's been part of human navigation for the uh, world. Well, several hundred years, right? And uh, the idea is that if you start from point A and you go to point B, there, since the Earth is uh, a hover side uh, surface, not really a sphere, uh, you have a formula that's been known since the Middle Ages, which is here, which tells you the angle at which you have to start moving, uh, supposing that you would move on a straight line. Right, so if you start, the example here is you, uh, well, if you fly, for instance, not sail, from Baghdad, uh, Iraq, to Osaka, Japan, you first, you know, you move in essentially a straight line on the globe, 
because these were chosen to be at more or less the same uh, latitude, but uh, of course you start at bearing 60, bearing being the angle between the normal and your and your uh, you know, your direction of movement, and you end up at bearing 120, right? So that's kind of how the bearing works, and then there is this formula that we can use to get the bearing as we move, and so we use this formula to calculate the bearing for each segment in the uh, uh, trajectory of long liners. Of course, these long liners do not move continuously on a straight line. They can move and change a bit and move and change a bit. The question is, when do they change sharply enough for us to declare a segment? So we have done kind of a, a measure on this that uh, seems to work empirically. We discretize the bearings. Then we have used the measure which is based on uh, simple significant uh, p test, uh, significant p test, to see if the change is significant or not. And with that, we we collect points where we think the bearing change is significant, and we build these trajectories. So here's an example. Here's the labial segmentation from the first sort of, uh, attack that we did on this data. And here's how many more segments you get if you use this approach that we have used here. So it's kind of a denser and I think more uh, detailed and more granular approach to represent this type of both my data. Uh, now we have, uh, like I said, used machine learning different methods. In fact, uh, we use the points, the uh, position, speed, and course, the context information. So not only the point-wise information, but also for each point, we give context information in the sense of uh, the data about the segment that point is part of. So average speed, acceleration, distance, etc. for the segment is in. Then we have discovered, which was uh, surprising, that uh, almost basically all the uh, robust machine learning algorithms give us roughly the same results. So we actually work with ensembles of decision for us. But, you know, if we went to uh, uh, support vector machines, for instance, we were getting roughly the same results. So it's not really uh, a big issue as it has been observed in sort of scaling applications. Uh, we have, since we have limited long data, we have experimented on trollers in a sense that uh, there's an interesting machine learning exercise called transfer learning that you train on data of one kind that you apply on data of another kind and you see how well your, your profile that you train for adjusts. And uh, also, it, it turns out that for practical reasons that I won't go into, it's a separate talk to work on this, ships that are close to shore, like 10 miles or closer, move in patterns that are different from ships that move beyond that horizon. So when we have subtracted data that's close to shore data, which is doubled by different rules and principles, the results get much cleaner and much better, which is you know, reasonable because the large ships mostly fish outside that All right, so here's some results. I just wanted maybe I will go into a detailed analysis. Uh, if accuracy is the measure, which is a big if, and we have uh, others, uh, you know, we get, uh, for this transfer learning, we get 87%. Uh, accuracy, uh, where if it's straight in the domain, it's only long time, it's significantly better, it's 45 percent better. So 90 percent isn't bad as a filter because it actually will give us a sufficiently performing, uh, you know, well performing uh, 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 classifier to be used in these global estimations. And uh, interestingly enough, after we started this research, uh, no other but Google has got interested in this. And Google now has a data version website called, called globalfishingwatch.org, uh, sorry, globalfishingwatch.org, where you can go anytime, uh, even now if you have Wi-Fi, and you will see uh, the AIS data uh, as it is, or you can go historically back, or you can focus on it area and it shows you when the, the, the 
for fishing ships when they are fishing or not. And they want value, of course, this is Google, what kind of machine learning model is being used. I think the one that's currently being used on the data is really just for trawlers, the speed thing, but they're working, of course, on something much more sophisticated and uh, uh, we try to talk to them, get them interested in uh, what we do. And in fact, you go to the, the, the sort of uh, uh, legend of this, this website, globalfishingwatch.org. Uh, we are, at uh, our we are uh, listed as one of the collaborators for the Google project. So, uh, well, we've done the kind of testing. Uh, and so, uh, the results that we have with this advanced data engineering, that's how I call it, they are generally uh, uh, better than those in, uh, without it that we have first uh, produced. And interestingly enough, we have now, because of course we need to look at other data as well, the AIS data is the focus, but how does that apply to other types of mobility? So in mobility, uh, machine learning on mobility data, the standard benchmark is this data set known, geo, known as GeoLife, which is uh, about human mobility in a large uh, uh, city in Asia, I believe it's Beijing, which has been provided for the community. There are seven types of movements, pedestrians, bicycles, cars, uh, I don't know, others. Um, and, uh, and you want to uh, classify a given moving object in one of those. So, so there are, uh, there, this data is used generally. And we have gotten uh, very good results, actually, state-of-the-art results on this. So, uh, so this is uh, sort of classical machine learning that we have used. We have gone and done two other interesting things with this data. So one uh, 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 approach that we have started, and I think uh, there is more potential for it, but uh, of course, uh, when you work with student thesis, you know, the student comes in and does this piece of work that they finish and go on to something else. So we have now uh, a bit of a pause in this research, but hopefully we go ahead. Let me explain what this is all about. So uh, I also do a lot of work with text data, completely besides the AIS uh, work that uh, I'm presenting. And uh, when you work with text, one of the key problems is something called information extraction. Information extraction is this idea that you have a corpus of text. For instance, you have seminar announcements. And you have you know, thousands of corpus. And you want to build a system that will extract certain type of information from that corpus. For instance, it will extract um, the affiliation of the speaker, right? It's usually that. So how do you do that? Well, uh, Essentially, first you label your data. So you put a person in front of a screen, and that person in some way times part of the text, and it says, oh, here the affiliation name begins, and here the affiliation name ends. And then you give it to a, a system, state of the art is this algorithm known as conditional random fields. Conditional random fields are a mix of Bayesian methods and Markovian methods. So of course it's Markovian because uh, you can pretty well predict uh, that the affiliation comes after the name, right? most of the time. Right? Sometimes they come first, but mostly after the name. So if you have a, a, a lexical apparatus to detect names, then it's a good hunch that uh, what follows is affiliation. So that's the Markovian part, and if there are certain words that are frequently associated with the affiliation, like university or department, then the evidence is even stronger. That's the Bayesian part. So this Markovian, Markovian Bayesian combined approach, that is the state of the art uh, information extraction. But if you think about it, it's a little bit, our fishing, not fishing, is a little bit like that. We have sequences of elements, like words, these segments, and some are fishing and some are not fishing. And there may be, and probably some latent, relationship between the sequence of events when they're not fishing and then they start fishing. We don't know later, we don't know what it is, but hey, if we run CRF on it, maybe we'll discover it. So we had uh, one thesis looking at this problem and it you know, produced some 
results which are actually quite close to these earlier results with, uh, I would say, with the background of CRF, but it's, it's essentially here, it's this Bayesian Markovian uh, approach that I was talking about. And uh, we have the results, and you see that the accuracy, you know, is a little lower, but for some shapes it's actually higher. So ballpark uh, mean is 89, so it's like this transfer that we, that we did. So, so it's not an unreasonable idea. And I think we can do better with it if we are to continue with this. All right, so then, like I said, we have gone to this deep learning. So for deep learning, I have little time, so I will do this very quickly. Uh, let me see, yes. Uh, so uh, essentially, this is sequential data, right? It's these, these segments and forms. So for sequential data, you use something known as, uh, so first of all, you discretize your data, and uh, if anybody is interested in the details, we have a paper in IJCNF in uh, May 2017 that uh, argues why we need to discretize the data and, and how we do it. So we, we discretize the data, and my approach was not small for that. And then the idea is that when you have sequential data, how do you, of sort of any length, how do you deal with this in terms of a, an adequate neural network? You have what's called recurrent neural network. So the idea is you, in a loop, uh, produce a layer, a hidden layer, and each hidden layer is addressing one element of your sequence in an abstract. And so this is your recurrent neural network. But of course, uh, the, the way the neural networks work, they collect these weights at one layer, pass it to the other layer, and they uh, compute the gradient and so on. If this was the sole approach, you have a, a numerical problem of vanishing and exploding gravity. That's been observed in this research uh, a long time ago. I just referred to it here. And uh, uh, 20 years ago, or more actually, Schmidhuber uh, has proposed a solution to it, which is now uh, made in an incredible career it's known as long short term memories, LSTMs, which essentially are a solution of this vanishing and exploding gradient whose particular values as they get transmitted between uh, layers of the network and they protect these values by keeping them in an artificial way from one generation to the other. And uh, uh, this is done through uh, Said the mechanism, there's a number of them. Uh, one of them are these gates, for that uh, gates, input gates, and output gates, and they are uh, usually done through the uh, logistic uh, function, but there's other mechanisms now that people try that are very successful. So this is just standard. We went to uh, TensorFlow and used these things, uh, in fact, in a little more sophisticated way. So instead of having <laughs> One way LSTMs, we have two way LSTMs, uh, and you know, we can build this complexity quite easily. Uh, and uh, uh, we have used the Google TensorFlow for that. Uh, we have used state of the art stochastic gradient descent uh, method, which uh, of course is the reverse here because the neural network that's the key uh, component. It's uh, some kind of a search that's uh, uh, gradient descent and uh, uh, of course, if you go, uh, really all the methods, because of the size of the data, they go to stochastic gradient descent, which is an order of magnitude more uh, performing than uh, just the ordinary gradient descent, right? Because it chooses statistic, stochastically only one dimension at the third instead of all. Uh, and we have used other sort of tricks that are known in the field, and we got. Uh, uh, these results. So, uh, okay, so we'll just look at them here. Uh, so these are uh, on slightly different data. Uh, uh, these are different uh, sort of variants of uh, with discretizations. You see that the discretization is really key because it lifts us up 15 percent. And then there are different uh, methods for these gates that keep uh, memory in the STM. So we can lift it up 
again to something like the levels we had before and beyond that. But, uh, you know, this is just the beginning of these uh, uh, deep learning methods because here we still work with the very phase representation that I was talking about and you really want to go beyond that uh, into this sort of dream of deep learning that we will just throw at the deep learning method the raw data, raw trajectories it just as point coordinates, pairs of point coordinates longitude latitude and hopefully a deep learning method will go and produce uh, a right uh, neural network, deep neural network representation for it. Uh, <coughs> I think the challenge is that we, have, we are far from having sufficient label data, so the really one would mean, and that's where I try to push this research towards to go what, what's called the semi-supervised techniques, where you have some molecule of label data, and you have practically unlimited unlabeled data, which is AIS data, but not labeled with fishing or fishing, and have a method that will exploit this unlabeled data in a way that will make it all work. And of course, this uh, semi-supervised approach has been tried in other techniques, ways, and so on. Uh, okay, I'll skip this because I'm running out of time. I promise I will talk for a moment about the system level techniques, so let me take a couple of minutes here to do that. Uh, so what is the problem? The problem is that with the data sizes I have reported originally, uh, so 15 terabytes next year, if we load it and we land it, of course, into a, a standard database like Postgres, for instance, uh, this doesn't work. The data is too big. So what we do, we have uh, developed a solution uh, which uh, is based on a, a particular tool uh, uh, that we use here, this is SOLAR, it's an Apache index. And the idea is you have a database, you map the database into a, an index, so you can retrieve the data from the index, uh, but very efficiently and at scale, which is impossible with your Postgres, you can't necessarily do everything. So you take your data, so like a little bit of the sort of thing that I was advocating when I was talking about the, the, the Raw, you take the data and you build a data structure that will allow you to do certain types of operation on this data as a data set. So here it's search. And then you use that data structure from then on. And you can, of course, rebuild the structure, but it takes a long time, it takes hours. On the other hand, once you have the data structure, it's extremely efficient to work with it. So this is what we have done. We have developed that search tool using SOLAR. Uh, it's a simple cloud configuration that runs on. Uh, and uh, queries are uh, very efficient. Uh, the indexes that we have delivered now have about half, uh, 500 million, half a billion uh, records each. So uh, it's very large, very too large for Postgres. Uh, we could do larger. It's just that uh, the equipment we run on uh, is, you know, has been a bit parameter. These are pretty well vanilla servers that, uh, that to give an idea, you know, that they cost about $10,000. So it's not really uh, big data equipment that we use for this, uh, but we can deal with very significant data uh, collections here of, of the size that I was talking about. And, uh, uh, we don't necessarily put in all of the AIS on the six fields, the ones that we use, but this gives us a solution. Here are some performance numbers, so uh, for uh, 500,000, uh, uh, half a million, uh, sorry, 500 million, uh, 500,000 points, sorry. Uh, we have this, so you see that as you, as you would like, the performance uh, is linear, I mean, scale is linear, which is exactly what you need. You don't want the performance to uh, degrade quite rapidly or worse. So this solution uh, works and we are very happy with it and now we're using it also on uh, other large data sets which have a partnership with uh, uh, an Atlantic Canada gaming company that has global operations. They collect data about people uh, playing games on their machines. It's huge. They cannot uh, work with this data on their servers, so 
we show them how to apply this solution and others, particularly number of B, to, uh, to, to begin the process. So, uh, so, you know, in terms of uh, future work, we are looking now at uh, other system solutions, uh, particularly five and number of B. We are uh, very interested in something that's not always associated with uh, sort of data science uh, because it's not empirical work of the data but more work of data management and data representation solutions. So uh, how do you describe your data? What are the right ontologies? How can you map uh, your queries into database queries? And particularly what we're interested in is something that I think is far from being addressed by the two communities, which is uh, the fact that we would take the data, run machine learning on it, learn some interesting relationships in the data that uh, we want to be able to discover, translate these relationships into a persistent database query, let's say at the Sparkle level, and then have the Sparkle sitting on top of a database and periodically query. So the idea is to make that connection between machine learning and data representation database. And that's what we're doing. Uh, we're also interested in standardization of the data, particularly with this machine learning, with this ocean machine learning space. It's really important because we now have huge development of sensors and the success of that data collection will to a large extent develop and depend on uh, global standards on how this data is represented, what is mapped into, what ontologies could be involved in these mappings and so on. So we're uh, interested in connecting to this type of research. We're very interested in visualization. We have some neat examples of that. I don't have time to talk about it. We are also working, uh, besides the fisheries, with the, you know, what's the largest uh, group of uh, researchers here in uh, uh, Atlantic Canada, uh, which is the uh, Defense Research Development Canada group uh, here in Halifax that of course uh, has long-standing uh, history of excellence in uh, work with acoustic data. They are moving to other types of data as well. It's very interesting to work with them. So, you know, we do lots of other stuff that I won't have time to talk about. Um, uh, I will skip the challenges because I'm running out of time. Of course, there's a number of uh, colleagues and uh, collaborators and graduate students uh, uh, that uh, contributed to all of that. Uh, so they, of course, I'm very grateful that they got to be acknowledged here. Uh, we have a number of sponsors uh, for this work that I'm um, uh, glad to acknowledge as well. And uh, that's all I wanted to say. I'd be happy to uh, have a question, to have questions and discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, for instance, determining uh, 
uh, yeah, um, the next point, for instance, yeah, they, they may so, yeah, thank you. We will. Yeah. Sort of a general question about um, measuring how successful these things are. So, so you showed a lot of charts that indicated um, the percentage of accuracy. Yes. Sensitivity, yes. So what numbers are you looking for? If I do something 90% correct, that sounds good, but I'm identifying the task of Yeah. I think the further question is a very good question. We had long discussions with our fish ecologists on that. So they wanted 100%. And I will say, no, 100% is a, you know, it's impossible to begin with. And if we ever get 100%, I would be very worried because it means we overfitted the data grossly if we go to a testing set. I would say two things about this. First of all, something I learned and I feel very strongly about, and it's not, unfortunately, not the standard paradigm in research, is that for these types of data where you, uh, the data is collected over time, the only correct way to do the train test is to test on the data which is temporarily following the training data. So you, why? Because that's how your deployed model will work. You will always learn up to a certain time and use later. Models that use standard cross-validation, I, I think, do an, do an incorrect job for evaluation. Because there will be some latent relationships. If you don't cut on time like that, you will not isolate them and you will have falsely optimistic results. That's one. The second thing, what is the right measure? I, I have an answer to this, but it's practically impossible. That's what I call the biologists. I said the only, un because remember that this is very typical in research, we only had one biologist label the data. I said if you, if there were two people, they worked in parallel and then we used something like O and Kappa coefficient and we should, that's what we should be comparing again. The difference between our model and the human to human difference. But of course, you know, we don't have another expert, it's just a, a practical problem that's very typical in machine learning. But this is how I would really do it if I had my brothers and unlimited groups. Any further questions? Right, then let's uh, thank our speaker.